Hey, it's Adam here and you're watching The Culture Hack. We're talking about how to create engaged workspaces that unlock the potential of your teams and drive your business forward in ways you've never seen. So stay tuned. Okay, Ken Cameron, welcome to The Culture Hack. I am super excited to have Ken Cameron on, me, on with me today. He is the CEO and shift disturber of Corporate Culture Shift. So welcome, Ken. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Oh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. This is uh, this is uh, super exciting. I've been meaning to have you on for a long time, and now here we are, and we've collaborated before in a bunch of stuff. So now we just get to chat and have some fun. But first, tell uh, everyone about Corporate Culture Shift. Great. Corporate Culture Shift is my little boutique consultancy firm around organizational culture and uh, and culture building. So it's um, a lot of the work that I do centers around helping organizations and people get employees engaged and take ownership of the strategic direction of the company. So I try to think of a big triangle. If we draw a big triangle in the air and the top piece of the triangle, that capstone piece is the strategy. So I often lead strategic planning sessions, both for-profit organizations and non-profit organizations, usually small to medium-sized businesses. So, so I, you know, I'm not, I, it's not my world with the big giant global cor mega corporations, but I, I love organizations where you can really make a difference because they're of, you know, kind of right bite-sized, right? And, and then in the middle layer of that triangle is kind of that middle chunk of the triangle is where culture eats strategy for breakfast. You know, you can do all of that piece you want around strategy with um, with your leadership team on a three day retreat. You can pull our one day retreat and you can kind of pull together this beautiful vision of the future. And then you go back to work and nothing changes. And why is that? Why people, you know, the, the people keep doing the same old things that they always do. They keep doing it the same old way they always do. And you're not getting the improved results that you may have wanted to get or that you envisioned or that seemed so possible during that strategic planning retreat. And often that's because the culture in the middle has not been addressed. So that is to say that people, the leaders who are on the front line um, who are not actually embracing that strategy. They may have been informed about the strategy. They may have been told about the strategy. They may have been given a strategy document that now sits collecting dust on their shelf, but they're not putting it into action because they're not fully embodying it. So that's the middle piece that I do where I get people to really take ownership of the strategic direction rather than it simply being handed to them. I get them to kind of interpret it and manifest it in their own work and what that means to them every day. And then there's a kind of another layer to that triangle, kind of the bottom, the foundation piece of that triangle is those difficult conversations you need to have with people who aren't making that culture shift. And for that work, you're somewhat familiar with that work because we've done this together with one of your clients is that for that work, we bring in a live actor and that actor plays the employee or leader who is being recalitrant or isn't kind of measuring up or isn't taking ownership of that strategy. And we get that actor to, we build a scenario for that actor and we get that actor to kind of push back against and to resist in all sorts of different ways so that you as a leader really get to train your and, and exercise those muscles on how to have those difficult conversations with people who aren't living the culture or living the strategy that you really want them to be doing. Okay, amazing. I see now where the shift disturber comes from. Right. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of poking the bear, right? There's a lot of there's a lot of a lot of bears to be poked around in that tribe. Yeah, right? absolutely. I love it. I feel like you walk around with a bit of a sharp stick and just <laughs> <laughs> No, it's a gentle it's a sharp stick with like a little towel wrapped around the end of it. Right? There you and a flower on the end of it. <laughs> Perfect. Uh Cool. Well, I, I love that you kind of live in these kind of three areas of your pyramid or your triangle, as you said. And, um, you know, the word engagement is being tossed around like, like crazy right now. So what does engagement mean to you uh, in terms of your your world and your triangle? Well, you know, I guess what I might start by saying, you know, um, really is that I effing hate the word engagement. Like, just, let me just put that out there and be, be really yeah. positive. I effing hate engagement because to me, that is engagement is something that leadership expects of or demands of their employees. And it's something that kind of comes from the top down, right? And it's, it's like, you know, here's our, it's kind of the, what I described to you earlier in that sense of like, here's our strategy. Now go do it. Right? And we expect you to be engaged with that strategy. And what I try to aim for is kind of more of a bottom-up ownership of the strategy. 
So I think that something more powerful than uh, buy-in and more powerful than engagement is actually ownership. And what I mean by that is I try to really work with the um, people at all levels of the organization to, and I use the storytelling technique using a, uh, a couple of different um, uh, facilitation card decks that I've co-created with colleagues of mine. And I use those card decks to kind of get people talking about what's important to them in their work and what's important to them in their organizational culture. Because once you get them talking about what matters to them, is then you can get them to to draw that parallel line to the strategic direction that the organization wants the, them to go in and how they, and they can connect that directly to their work. And once they can make that connection for themselves, then you get that ownership. And once you've got that, then you don't need engagement because they're they're owning the thing all the time. Mm -hmm. I love that. I, I, I love that. I love that notion that uh, engagement is a uh... Like throw it away. <laughs> we don't even need it. So, you know, maybe, maybe we don't throw it away, but you know, let, let's say engagement is for suckers. Engagement is for the average ordinary company that's kind of stalled. That is kind of, um, you know, it's okay. They're coasting, you know, they're okay with the engagement. You know, they're not failing. You know, it's not like you have employees who are disengaged uh, or it's not that you have a strategy that isn't working or on uh, in any way, you know, you just, you're doing okay. But you know, what I like to work with is organizations that want to be exceptional. Organizations that realize that kind of ordinary is kind of sucky and that want to really, really step up their game. And also who have employees who are ready to step up their game. Those are the kind of organizations that really turn my crack. Okay, all right. Well, you talked about, you know, storytelling and all that. Do you have any stories of some of the work you've done and some of the uh, results that you've seen? You know, I, I guess the result that I'm most proud of and that I talk about a lot uh, these days is um, about 10 years ago, I was asked to lead a strategic planning retreat for the Calgary Stampede. And that retreat was the one where they decided to fully 100% commit to building that new convention center, which just opened in yeah. June. And so it was like, you know, a big plan that they were, uh, like at the time that they hired me, they reached out to me, they had a new CEO um, after 12 years of the previous CEO. And they had a new board chair, which turns over every two years. So that wasn't such a big deal. But they also had, the, the, so the CEO really wanted to like really get a temperature check with the board. Because if they decided to embark on this ambitious, 10-year site redevelopment master plan that they had developed and let me just make it really clear they'd already come to me with that master plan developed and my job was to do a check temperature check with the board and to get them to fully take ownership of that direction and one of the things that he said to me was um like you know i i, I want to know what the board's appetite for risk is like do we build this convention center ourselves and take all the profit but then we also take all the risk or do we go in with a partnership? Do we build the hotel ourselves and go into and, and build it all ourselves and take all the risk? Or do we go in a partnership with somebody and they take all, or do they take, do we let them build it and they take all the profit? And I realized, well, listen, you can ask your board this question and they will tell you, take all the profit, take all the risk. And then in five years, when the economy tanks, they're gonna turn around and they're gonna fire your ass because you gave them what they said they wanted. You didn't give them what they actually wanted. So we spent three days in this board retreat. Um, we brought in um, a colleague of mine from uh, Washington, D.C., who's like kind of a senior venerated fellow and um, named Chris McGough, whose book I love. His book is called The Primes. So a little plug for Chris there. And we brought him in and we, he led a series of conversations that opened up their um, opened up their willingness to really honestly talk about their strategy and to talk about what their fears were um without all of the all of the baggage that comes with being on a high profile board like that and then we actually once we kind of did that we did a bunch of future forecasting exercises so they could really see what the future might look like in various kinds of circumstances and so then they came out of that with like kind of a vision that they could that they everybody could commit to and so the astute listeners among here will realize there is no hotel that was one of the things they decided not to do 
it was in that 10-year master plan and they kind of decided well okay well let's we, we need, let's do the convention center but let's hold off on that hotel you know it's kind of in the works now they're kind of thinking about it and they're thinking about doing it now in partnership with somebody rather than taking all the risk so the, the, and there were a series of other decisions behind the scenes that I won't talk about uh, for confidentiality reasons where they decided to do some things but not do a lot of other things and that was a really important pivotal moment for them to have that conversation because as you know uh you know the uh, the converse, the economy did tank afterwards and things did change one of the things that really changed was um uh, you know i gave everybody different topics i said you know you guys are going to talk about politics you guys can talk about economics you guys are going to talk about what happens if the if you know the um, uh, demographics to shift suddenly in the city all of which has happened but the political group went away and they came back remember this is 10 years ago they came back and they said okay so politics now there's an election in in two months so let's just pretend that the ndp gets elected like, let's just pretend. Like, it'll never happen in Alberta. But let's just pretend the NDP might possibly get elected. What would we do then? And they outlined exactly what they would do if there was a change in government after this 40, whatever it was, 44 years of conservative rule. And two months later, what happened? The, um, the, the NDP got elected. Two months after that, they got a $2 million cut to their budget. But they were prepared for how to deal with that $2 million cut to the budget. Because even though they'd been joking about it and hadn't taken it seriously, the exercise had forced them to run through what was important to their value proposition, what was important to their values, and how they might mitigate a change. So with all of that kind of exercises around that over the course of three days and with that kind of open-minded, open-ended discussion that I described, they were able to really really take ownership of that new strategic direction and it's great so great to see that uh, having been fulfilled very cool that's such a cool story right you're as you said the board is just going to say well more profit right but <laughs> yeah right you know, <laughs> it doesn't say that <laughs> exactly but you know that's a different thing than being like i'm a board member taking ownership and emotionally resonating with this what does this really mean right versus whatever do this and then three years from now I'll have a different opinion right so yeah that's yeah. yeah that's that's a pretty cool story and obviously this thing's a big deal for Calgary so it's a very relevant uh example do you see you know looking into the future companies are they doing this type of thing more is this type of um shift disturbance becoming um, a, a little more talked about. Like, I feel like even five years ago, uh, this was not talked about in, in terms of business and, and ROI and performance and all this kind of stuff, whereas now it is. So where do you see, where do you see this going? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like we're in this present situation now where um, organizations and companies really acknowledge that having a, um, a engaged workforce to use your term but to have a um, uh, to, to build a culture where people want to work at is no longer a nice to have that it is now an imperative it's a business imperative and I think people are really seeing the return on investment that it that that it means. Like, it, I mean, there's been a lot of math and a lot of numbers shoved out there that um, you know, for every employee that you lose to re place that employee, retrain that employee, and also the lost productivity of um, spooling up that new employee is the equivalent of six to nine months of someone's salary. And if you're in a corporation where you're where you're losing, like turning over, like let's say, just to say like a small number of like 10 people a year, that's huge. Even 10 people a year is huge. If you're in a larger company where you're losing more than that, which most companies are, then then you're, you know, that's a lot of money out the door every single year. And if you can spend a fraction of one person's salary to create a workplace that where people are take ownership of the work that they do every day and then they don't want to leave because as we know people don't leave bad bosses they leave bad environments they leave bad cultures so the so the if you can create an environment where people want to stay, then you can immediately reduce your or your expenses. You can immediately reduce your overhead. And there's only two ways to make money: in is that you can reduce expenses or you can increase revenues. And if you can get an engaged workforce, you can do both at the same time. 
And, you know, people like you and me, we can do that for a fraction of the cost of that kind of turnover that we're talking about. Okay. Well, I, I think there, there's no um, clear way really to say that, right? But, I mean, you and I obviously very bought into this idea, but... Um, yeah, you know, there's another direction for this, like the future is really going and everybody's talking about AI and, and oh, AI is going to take our, our jobs away from us. And it, it truly, it probably, much of it probably will, but there's also that expression, those of us who, you, AI won't take your job away, but a person who uses AI will take your job away is, <laughs> is, is what they're saying, right? Yeah. And there's, there's a lot of really interesting movements in the culture space using AI. I've got a colleague um, who works at a company called Cratic AI, Cratic is in Democratic. I love what he's doing. He's taking um, a lot of the work that I do individually with like work groups, like in an analog in-person meet them kind of way. And he's automating that using AI so that the AI begins to act as a facilitator that sends you an email every week that says, hey, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? And then listens to your responses that you might type in and then asks you new and interesting questions. So that the AI is doing what I'm doing, but the AI is able to do that at a massive scale. And it's able to do that every week. And unlike me, the AI never loses interest, never goes on vacation. The AI is always like every week is like, hey, wait a minute, last week you said this, what about this? And um, and always asks the next best question. And I, I find that really interesting. And you know, my, my thinking is that this isn't uh, an AI that's gonna replace me. Um, it's an AI that's going to, if I can use it and leverage it, that's going to make the work that you and I do so much better. Right. So I think the future of this culture work is super exciting. And I think it's super exciting, not just because of the technology, but because the technology can allow people like you and me and your listeners to create more of a difference for more people, to create an even more exciting workplace. I, I think that's fantastic. And I am super excited about Craddock as well. We actually just signed up we're going to be using craddock uh, with my team so oh fantastic yeah oh fantastic oh that's great oh i'm so excited to hear that yeah it's it's going to be uh pretty cool i think but uh ken thank you so much for sharing all these gems i just love your your view of the world and the energy you bring so thank you very much oh pleasure pleasure thanks for having me on the show and i'm looking forward to hearing from your listeners hey thanks for watching the culture hack do you want to chat culture and engagement give us a call and come on the show